First up this morning, we have Will Barnes, who's going to talk to us about a complete fiasco. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, my name's Will. Uh, I am a fifth year grad student at Rice University, I'm working primarily in solar physics. So this is another, another solar physics talk to, to follow Danny's. So I'm going to be talking about a, a package that I've been working on for the past uh, six or eight months, um, uh, dealing with atomic data and as assimilating atomic data into uh, both simulations and observations. Um, and I'd like to thank the, the SOC for giving me the opportunity to, to give this talk as well. OK, so just some quick contact info. There's my GitHub, Twitter, my blog, as well as my email. Um, and then that the URL in the, in the bottom left-hand corner um, should show these slides. So if you'd like to follow along on, on your laptop, then you can go ahead and do that. OK, so this is a solar physics talk. And I think every solar physics talk has to start uh, with a pretty picture most likely from AIA. So this, these are, this is an active region on the surface of the sun um, imaged in the six EUV channels of AIA. Um, and of course, these are really nice and pretty pictures. Um, but right, what we ultimately want to know as solar physicists and more broadly as astronomers um, is what, you know, what, what is the underlying physics of, of these objects for us? It's the sun. Um, and we want to know specifically you know, what is the, what's the temperature and density structures of, of the plasma. Um, and to, to understand that from the images that we take, right, we need to know what sort of processes are producing the emission that we're collecting. So this means what, what spectral lines are emitting um, in the pass bands of our instrument. Um, and we know at what temperatures and what densities are these lines forming. And so in solar physics, the primary tool that we use to do this is something called the Chianti Atomic Database. So Chianti uh, is a database um, uh, and a software package for doing analysis of high temperature, low density, optically thin astrophysical plasmas. Um, it was developed around 1995 and was a, is a collaboration between uh, Cambridge, the University of Michigan, um, as well as George Mason University. And so it, um, what you're seeing here is sort of the, if the periodic table of Chianti, if you will. And so it, it includes about 30, uh, 30 different elements, a total of 495 different ions. And so what this is showing specifically is, is a heat map of the number of ener available energy levels per ion. So in particular, you can see iron um, includes, so right here, includes quite a few energy levels, specifically in iron 9 or 11. You can see that these include about 995, or uh, anywhere between sort of 700 to 900 energy levels in some cases. So um, this is fairly complicated data. And I, I would sort of describe it as roughly kind of medium-ish size data. So the, the, the data and both, and both the code are available um, via SSW, which Danny talked about a little bit in the, in the previous talk. Um, so the database is about two gigabytes in size, um, and it's distributed as thousands of plain text uh, files. Um, so you know you you get it as a tarball. When you unzip the tarball, it's just a nested uh, directory um, with a bunch of files attached to each ion. And so Chianti isn't just the data; it's also a software package for parsing the data um, and computing common quantities such as ionization rates, recombination rates. Um, spectra, contribution fu functions, these, these types of things. Um, and it's essentially, a, I wouldn't call it so much of a library as, as a collection of useful IDL scripts um, for getting things out of the data or computing these common quantities. Um, it is versioned in a loose sense, but there's no, uh, there's no backwards compatibi compatibility. So if I want to go look at, say, so the county database is currently on about version 8, version 8 point something or another. If I want to go back and look at version five, there's no piece of software that I can use to 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 look at that data. Um, so this is an issue. So many you'll notice many of these issues are uh, issues that are were also common to the SSW stack. Um, there is some documentation, and they have a couple of like helpful PDF guides, but they aren't necessarily kept up to date um, with the current version. Um, the idea is that the software is tested before it's released by the team, but there's no automatic tests. And there's also no clear way to contribute code. So this, I, I believe it is version controlled on like an SVN trunk somewhere, but this is, it's not public, it's not on GitHub. 
Um, and it does, there's no, like you can't just submit a pull request to Chianti. Um, and this is, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, this is an all in IDL, um, like much of our code in solar physics. Uh, but there is, there was an attempt uh, in 2003 to sort of mitigate this problem. This is in the, in the form of something called the Chianti Pi package, which is developed by uh, Ken Deere, who's a member of the kind of core Chianti team. Um, and so he started this in the early 2000s. This is essentially before the, you know, the pre-NumPy days. Um, and so Chianti Pi has been extremely useful, um, but it has developed uh, a lot of baggage uh, in the past uh, you know, 15 or so years. Um, and I would say, and I started contributing to it about, I would say, two years ago. And I wanted to add a lot of things, you know, things that we kind of take for granted, as, especially in this room, um, things like units, testing, automated documentation builds, uh, PEP8 is a big one. Um, and I found that I broke the master branch quite a bit. Um, and so we realized that this was a problem. And eventually we, s we settled on it being best to sort of pull all these improvements into a new package. So the result of this was this package that I've called uh, Fiasco. So it's called Fiasco because the, the style of the bottle that you typically use to serve a Chianti wine is called a Fiasco in Italian. And it also is just a fitting name, I think, for the, the process a lot of us go through day to day <laughs> when developing these kinds of things. So um, like I said, yeah, I've been working on it for about eight months. Um, it's licensed under the BSD three clause license. Python 3 only, um, there's documentation builds on read the docs, there's testing on Travis CI, which Adrian discussed uh, a little bit earlier. Um, I haven't had uh, done like a formal release yet, and it's not available on PIP or Conda, but that should be coming soon. Um, but if you'd like to try it out, it is available on, on GitHub, and you can go and clone and just set up.py, install it. Um, okay, so now what I'd like to do is just kind of go through the different basically what the package does and sort of the different components of it. Um, okay, so the first thing we want to do, we have this database, we want to be able to parse the data. So, how, so the, how do we do that? So this kind of shows a typical, what a typical Chianti data file looks like. So again, this is just a plain text file. Um, and okay, this doesn't look too bad, right? This is just typical col columnar data. Um, the one thing you'll notice is that there's no, um, headings, so there are no descriptions of what these columns are. There's a bit of metadata at the bottom of the file, but it basically just tells where the source is, wh where this data came from originally. But okay, I mean, you could probably do basically a split or maybe read this in pandas pretty easily. Okay, but this is just one of the file types. There are actually 13 possible, up to 13 possible file types per ion. Um, and again, there's 495 ions, so you can imagine this, is, this becomes sort of an issue, especially when you have different files where, the, so these, these three rows that I've highlighted in yellow are actually all, should all be logically grouped together. So these second two rows are actually arrays that really belong to the first row. Okay, so now we have to do some sort of grouping by rows. Um, and then the, the sort of second example that I'm showing, you can see that there's not really a delimiter between, so these, these, these kind of middle columns right here, right here are, are, should be separate but there's, no, there's not even white space between them. Okay, so this is, this is an issue also. So we need to come up with some way to, uh, basically a unified interface for parsing all these different file types, giving them some metadata, and ideally we'd like the same interface to all these files. So the way that Fiasco does this is through this kind of parser object. Um, and so this is just an example of it. And so you can see that, yeah, I, okay, I import this thing called parser and I can give it any, any of the file types, just the name of the file, it does, and so for these, these, these different extensions, note these different file types in the database. It's not particularly important what they are, but they have, it, it's enough to say that they have different formats um, and different quirks to them. Um, and and so, what, so what this gives us is a unified interface, and what it returns is an AstroPy quantity table. So now I have metadata associated with each column, I have a, a header, and then I also have units associated with each column um, as appropriate. And the way the sort of magic behind this is, some, is through something called a, a factory pattern. So this is similar to the way SunPy handles maps. Um, when, you, when you give it a, a, a specific map, it looks at what instrument that came from and instantiates a specific class for that map. So this is, works the same. If I give it a specific file type, it gives me back a, a parser specific for that data. And what you can see on the right is the inheritance diagram 
that shows how all this works. Um, but we don't want to, to parse this data every time we want to use it in the package. Um, and so what Fiasco does is it builds all this into an HDF5 file, which if you're not familiar with what these are, it's essentially sticking a whole file tree into a single file and makes access to it really easy and it handles large data very well. Um, and so what you can see here is that we can easily write, the, this parser object provides us an easy way to write the data and then we can read it out um, just by giving it essentially a path to the data set. Okay, this is all great, but what the, the, the thing that's gonna be the most user facing is sort of the, the API. And so the kind of uh, core object in Fiasco is this thing called the ion object. And what this gives us is kind of metadata and derived quantities specific to a given ion. So you can instantiate it by just giving it um, the name of the element plus the ionization state or the charge state. And, and so this, the kind of lower lines show you that you can access basic metadata on it, like the element name, the ion name, the ionization stage, et cetera. Um, you can also get meaningful information from it by looking at the string representation of, of the object. So this is accomplished using this, uh, the so-called uh, repr method. Uh, what you might people hear them called dunder methods because they have this sort of dunder, double underscore appended to the, to the front of them. And what this allows you to do is give a custom representation of your, of, uh, of your object in the form of a string. Um, so we can also compute derived quantities like the ionization rate and the recombination rate from these, which is what m most of the users of Chianti um, are most interested in, is ca actually calculating things using this, this, uh, this atomic data. Um, finally, when it comes to the, the, this ion object, um, I can also access the energy levels associated with each ion through an index just like I would uh, a list. So if I say ion and I put a zero in the square brackets, just like I would access the first element of a list, I get the first energy level. Um, and so what, what it's actually returning is this other, op this other level object, and this gives me information like the level number, what the configuration is, and then this also lets me iterate through the levels of an ion. So if I wanna look at every level of an ion, I can, I can just construct a for loop um, like so. And this is done through this, uh, uh, get item method. So the, I'm just kind of providing these little examples on the side to show, um, kind of illustrate the, the different things that I learned about Python while, while developing these things. And hopefully this can be beneficial to, to others as well. Okay, so there, we have this ion object, but there are some things that we want to do associated with this data that involve multiple ions, um, and specifically maybe a particular element. So we can instantiate uh, an element just using, again, the element name plus a, a, a temperature. And then, again, if we, look, if we can index this element in the same way that we index the ion, and it's, but instead of accessing the energy levels, we're accessing the particular ions of that element, again, using this get item um, method. So I can iterate through the ions in an element just as I iterate through the energy levels in an ion. And I can do things like calculate the equilibrium ionization. So these are the, the population fractions of every ion as a function of temperature for that particular element. Um, and so this is a quantity that I, I, it requires multiple ions to compute, not just a single one. More generally, I can have an ion collection. So, so an element, the element class, it turns out is just a subclass of this ion collection because it's specifically the ions associated with a given element. But I might also want to compute quantities associated with just a, a, uh, an arbitrary collection of ions, some, if I wanted to keep a, a spectra or a radiative loss curve. And so I think this is one of the, the coolest things I've learned is that you can use this add operator, this double underscore add operator, uh, to, to basically tell your object how to behave under the addition operator. So um, if you look on the left-hand column, the kind of last two lines, I can add, literally add two, uh, two of my ion objects together and that returns to me an ion collection. Um, and so the, the right hand column, again, just sort of illustrates using a, a silly example how, how you would how go about doing this. So I can construct, this provides me an intuitive way to con sort of construct collections of ions. And so a particularly useful thing, like I said before, is computing spectra for, for a composite spectra for multiple ions. So let's say I create these three ions, one for iron 12, iron 24, and then calcium 17. 
And, and I want to see what the spectra is, specifically in the wavelength range that's coincident with the 193 angstrom channel on AIA, which is an important instrument for us. Um, and so, okay, if I just look at the spectrum for iron 24, I just have this little, sort of little blip around 192. And I, okay, now I add in my, my a calcium 17 ion and I look at what, okay, what's the resulting composite spectra? Still relatively few peaks in this range. Now when I add in the iron 12 ion, I can see that I, I, I fill out this, this spectral range uh, much more. And so what this is telling me is that iron 12 is the dominant emitter in this channel. Okay, so that's sort of the, just a, a brief summary of what the, the API looks like. I just want to touch on one last thing, which is related to sort of the, kind of the, uh, one of the challenges I encountered um, during the development. So I, on Read the Docs, I have a couple places where it auto-generates um, kind of plots from example code. I think someone mentioned that in their talk yesterday. Um, and unfortunately for me, it requires the, the, the atomic data uh, to do these, to run this example code. Um, but it turns out downloading and building the database for the, for the atomic data is expensive and it actually causes the read the docs build to time out. Um, so I needed a way to, to get at the data without having to download it. So I, I found the, these two, uh, specifically this one new li uh, library from the HDF5 group and it's called H5Serve. And what it essentially gives you is a REST API, so for people that are familiar with that, for your Chianti, or for your uh, HDF5 file. So you can essentially make REST calls like get uh, or post or whatever to, to an HDF5 file and it gives you a sort of a webware interface for your data. And so currently on Read the Docs Now, the way, the way it accesses the data is through this interface. So I have a, an HDF5 blob on a digital ocean droplet, and it's just it's just hitting that um, endpoint and getting the data that way. Um, and so I'll just probably end there because I'm already over time. But I just wanted to say so the the code is hosted on GitHub uh, under my name at Fiasco. It's on Read the Docs, as I said. Um, so the the code for these these slides is available on GitHub, and then there's also the Chianti webpage, which has a lot of useful information about the database in general. I'll just leave my acknowledgement slide up there. Thank you. All right. We have time for maybe one quick question, if we have one. Uh, yeah, this looks really great. I think this is something we've been lacking, at least in solid physics Python for a while that we really need. Um, I was wondering how easy um, how easy is it with your API to then sort of combine that with response functions and basically predict sort of pass bands of various instruments based on the spectra that you expect? Right. I mean, it should be just a matter of con calculating the, if you know what, calculating the contribution function essentially for every ion and then folding that through. If you have the, the wavelength response functions, then it's just a matter of folding those through and that sh those should give you, if it's safe, you wanted something like the temperature response functions. Then I mean it should be it should be an easy. This is actually what you're, you're touching on. This is essentially the reason that I started doing this is is to do exactly that. So I mean it, it should be very easy to do. Yeah. And can you include like uh, continuum as well as lines or is so that yeah the, the continuum data is is incorporated, but the sort of continuum like functions for calculating Bremsstrahlung are are not in there yet, but they will be. Yeah. All right. Thank Will again.